Okay, um, since we don't want to run too much into the lunch hour, uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so, uh, we'll, quick introductions. Uh, I'm Dean Kraft, and this is my colleague Brian Lowe, from the Cornell University Library, uh, talking today about, uh, about the Vivo Project, and uh, where we are and what we're up to. Um, so, the format, I will talk for about 10 minutes with a sort of a quick introduction to Vivo for anybody who's not familiar with it and an update on, uh, on what's happened recently with the project. Um, then Brian is going to talk about uh, the work on the Vivo ISF, our new ontology work, uh, combining research resources with uh, sort of extending the Vivo ontology to do a much better job with research resources. And then I'll pick up again at the end and talk about a very uh, recent project that extends, again, will extend the Vivo ontology in a uh, exciting new direction. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so what is Vivo? Um, it's actually, we think of it as four different things. Um, it's a piece of software. It's a system you can install and, and run at your institution. Um, it's a set of data, typically uh, linked open data made available as RDF on the web, um, institution-wide, publicly visible information. So, so the system doesn't support private information about individuals. It's, it's really focused on public information about research, re research researchers, uh, scholars, and their scholarship. Um, standards, it's the uh, Vivo Standard Ontology, uh, what we call Vivo Data, and now Vivo ISF, with the recent extensions. Um, and then it's a community, um, an open community with strong national and international participation. And I'll talk a little more about all of that. Um, so what does Vivo do? Vivo takes a whole bunch of information silos, um, both within and outside an institution, and pulls together all the information about researchers and research into one common normalized infrastructure. So HR data, faculty reporting data, self-input data, uh, research facilities, um, outside things like PubMed, um, all sorts of uh, information. And then it creates a sort of network of context around, uh, around researchers that uh, describes, I mean, demonstrates what it is that they do and what they're engaged in, and builds these networks that interconnect researchers with their sort of organizational structure, their publications, all of their, their academic life, projects, everything. Uh, okay. um, so what does Vivo look like? So this is my, uh, uh, what, what, uh, my page at uh, Vivo Cornell. Uh, the, uh, see, the two senior research associates are because I'm actually in both the endowed side and the, uh, the statutory side. Uh, positions well. um, and what does it look like elsewhere? Well, uh, we've got, uh, if you're in China, it looks like uh, the subject knowledge environment of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. In the Netherlands, uh, it's uh, like that. If you're at the University of Colorado at Boulder, uh, here's their CU Boulder uh, Vivo. Uh, Griffith University has uh, focuses more on sort of the research hub and finding individual researchers. Um, University of Melbourne uses the sort of find an expert interface to connect people with researchers in particular areas. Um, and then this is the uh, uh, Mexico City uh, Vivo installation. So, so lots of different sort of views and visualizations. The Vivo community, now over 100 institutions around the world. Uh, okay, so why is Vivo important? Um, it is the only standard way to exchange information about research and researchers across diverse institutions. Um, it provides authoritative data from institutional databases of record and makes it available publicly as linked open data so that other people can use this, build on it, um, create tools and other things. The structured Vivo data supports search analysis and visualization across institutions so the provost at Cornell can see all of what's happening at Cornell across all the diverse um, uh, colleges and departments, and then across consortia or other regional groupings. It is highly flexible and extensible. 
uh, to cover research resources, facilities, data sets, and much more. And we're going to be talking a lot about that. Uh, so the, the, given the way the system works, it displays this information, the underlying uh, RDF, the, this triple data, about an individual, either as an HTML page or directly, different uh, HTTP call, you get the actual underlying RDF data. So either way, you can get uh, the same information about the individual. So a lot of value for institutions and consortia creates this common data substrate. Uh, it supports distributed curation. So individuals can, uh, can maintain their review and maintain their own data. Departments can do it at the departmental level. Um, it, it doesn't require sort of a central office to be trying to collect all this information. It's actually the individuals who are closest to the information who do that, uh, that curation. And finally, data that you Vivo makes visible gets fixed. One of the biggest complaints we get when we put up Vivo was the data is wrong. Well, in fact, the data in the underlying university database is wrong. Vivo is just presenting that to you, and you're seeing it for the first time. <laughs> so, uh, so that's an important value of Vivo. It's a nice example. The U.S. Department of Agriculture is implementing Vivo. Um, they have a bunch of agencies. They have a large set of internal researchers, and they have no way to sort of see across uh, and make connections across that group. So it's a portal for 45,000 intramural researchers. Their long-term goal is actually to link Cornell and the other land-grant universities into a researcher network so they can really see all that's going on in the <coughs> agricultural area. Okay. Um, so Vivo really supports exploration and analytics. This is something that a number of uh, um, our partner institutions have really been working on. Um, it, since it's structured data in this common format, it can be easily navigated, analyzed, and visualized. Um, you can see the strengths of interconnections. I can see you know, how much are people in you know, this college actually working with in agriculture, working with folks in engineering. What are the, the interconnections within my campus and across uh, a consortia, a CTSA, Clinical Translation of Science Award consortia, you can see how much are the groups actually working together. Um, you create dashboards to understand academic outputs, map research engagements and impact, all sorts of useful things. So what does this kind of visualization look like? Here's a Cornell faculty member um, in biological environmental engineering. So we can visualize his co-author network. We can drill down on a particular um, <coughs> colleague within our network. We can also view his publications record across the full map of science. So what are the actual disciplinary areas that he, he publishes in? How does he fit over the, the sort of broad uh, uh, set of disciplines? You can do the same thing at an institutional level. So college level or whatever, so how does my, um, how does the set of publications play out over the broader disciplinary spectrum? Um, for the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at Cornell, we've done a map that shows the impact of, of individual research projects across the world. Again, you can do the same thing in New York State, drill down, get information about the individual projects, so you have this uh, geolocated information, it's easy to find out what's going on where when your local uh, state legislator shows up, you can immediately identify what projects are relevant to, to their uh, district. Um, another thing Vivo does, and we've been extending Vivo in the area of research data, is provides context. All of this sort of context around the researcher is also context around the research data. That kind of context is critical to being able to find research data sets that you could potentially make use of in your own research. The kinds of contexts that are valuable include the sort of standard narrative publications and citations, grants, research resources, data set registries, and web of linked open data. So here's a nice example that's been developed at the Laboratory of Atmospheric and Space Physics at CE Boulder. They have a set of data products. They basically have been curating this uh, this data set list by hand on the web. Um, but you know, 
trying to keep things up and make the connections, uh, it's very hard to do by hand. They've installed the Vivo instance where they've modeled the, uh, the spacecraft, the flight equipment that all of their instruments run on. They've modeled the individual uh, instruments, tied them in to the output data sets, tied those back to the researchers, the specific grants. So again, you have this entire constellation of information around the research data set, tying it to the, the, the resources that produced it. Um, there are other work in data set registries. Uh, in fact, early, uh, quite a while back, uh, University of Melbourne was doing um, a data set registry, the Australian National Data uh, Service. Yes, it is. Um, we've, uh, at Cornell, we've developed something, a project called Datastar over a number of years, um, which is a data registry tool. It allows you to create metadata and describe, uh, describe data sets in useful ways. It's the Melbourne site. Um, here's Datastar. You can sort of see a breakdown of how the data sets, in fact, themselves interrelate, how they relate, how they are cited, how the that ties together with, uh, with other data sets. Uh, particular data sets cited 14 times, linked to 23 publications as two related data sets. So again, you get the sort of full context in this structured data format. So what is Vivo today? Um, Vivo is an open community hosted by the DuraSpace organization. There's Jonathan, um, uh, 501c3. Uh, Vivo has a strong national and international participation. Uh, we are currently hiring. In fact, we have interviews we're scheduling right now. Uh, a full-time Vivo project director to help drive the project forward. Vivo is an open suite of software tools. Uh, the, we're release candidate four, right, for our 1.6 release. Uh, so hopefully, we're hoping this, this will pass all the tests and be uh, turned into the release itself. Very soon. It's a growing body of interoperable data, um, and uh, Brian will actually give some nice examples about that. And it's an ontology now, Vivo ISF, um, with a community driven process for extension. So now I will hand off to Brian to talk about the integrated semantic framework. Okay, thanks, Dean. Yeah, so I'm going to focus a little more about the, the data and how the data works, because um, there's Vivo, the software, the, this uh, release candidate four that we're hoping is going to do well, although I think it's going to go to release candidate five, and then maybe that'll be the last one. Uh, but then there's also Vivo, the data, and so you don't actually need any of the software that we write to be part of Vivo, um, and, and you can use a lot of other tools to produce the same kind of linked open data and be part of this, this big network of the context of, re of research. Um, so the Vivo ISF is the Vivo Integrated Semantic Framework. That's what the ISF piece is all about. And so what are we integrating with this? Well, it started out by being Vivo plus Eagle Eye. So in 2009, there was this major funding from the NIH uh, for the Vivo project. And at the same time, there was a parallel project called Eagle Eye. And so Eagle Eye was focusing on research resources while Vivo was focusing on the researcher networking. And they both had similar consortia of, of uh, institutions that were building this out. And it was really more just an artifact of the way the funding worked out because this was one-time stimulus funding from the NIH. It wasn't part of an established program. Uh, but they couldn't make this into one big giant grant. It was split out into these two different piles. Uh, but right from the get-go, there was the realization that there was an awful lot of overlap between what Vivo was interested in and what Eagle Eye was, was interested in. And they were both taking a semantic web approach to this and, and producing ontologies and putting together ontologies and producing semantic data. And so all along, we were in contact uh, between the two groups trying to coordinate to some extent what we were doing with ontologies and semantic data. Uh, but after that, that NIH uh, major funding, uh, it was time to then go through and actually put these two ontologies for Vivo and Eagle Eye together in a real way and actually have a, a common name, this, this ISF, this Integrated Semantic Framework, which is now Vivo ISF. And so that uh, led to this uh, um, CTSA Connect project, uh, which was led by uh, um, Melissa Hendel at Oregon Health and Science University. Um, this was an 18-month um, effort. Uh, one of the main things was, was putting together these two ontologies. 
Um, that's uh, by the Uzel Hamilton contract. And this is uh, the teams that are involved. This is, again, a, a multiple uh, institution endeavor. Um, and so, as you can see, there's, there's a, a fair amount of overlap between what, what Vivo and Eagle Eye were interested in. Over on the left, there's the, the people-focused world, uh, where we've got people's affiliations, who they work for, the roles that they play in different projects, uh, the grants that they're pursuing and investigating, the credentials they have. Uh, over on the Eagle Eye side, they get into more esoteric, real researchy things, like the genes that people are using in their research, and uh, various pieces of anatomy, and kinds of biomedical uh, uh, details on that side. But then in the middle, there's all kinds of overlap where there's different techniques that people are, are either uh, experts in or are using in particular investigations. The training that they've got, uh, publications they're producing, obviously, is something we're always interested in. Um, and protocols, things like that, that they're using in the course of their research. Um, so the ISF is all about making that work together in one harmonious way, rather than having it be an artificially separated um, uh, set of ontologies. And so the Vivo ISF ontology is really, um, it's an ontology that's, that's about making relationships. And in a lot of cases when people think about the word ontology, they might think more of a taxonomy, a set of terms. Um, that you're going to go and tag some piece of research with a particular scientific term that this is what it's about. And it's really, it's important to be clear that we're really not about trying to classify people's research. It's not about applying terms to things. It's more about, as Dean uh, mentioned earlier, this idea of building this rich context. It's about linking things together. And so when we want to talk about the details of what research is about, what people are actually studying, that's where we rely on other terminology that we bring in from other places. So down on this slide here in the lower right-hand corner, um, we've got the example of the Unified Medical Language System, which was uh, another piece of the CTSA Connect project that we'll mention a little bit later. Um, where we can bring in things like the uh, ICD-9 and 10 uh, build medical building codes and uh, the medical subject headings and things like that and the unified medical language system. These can all be kind of intertwined with other ISF data and that can provide the meat about what people are actually working with, what their, the, the patients that they're treating or the kinds of things that they're actually studying in their research. But then ISF weaves together all these other bits. And you can tie in the organizations that people are associated with, the documents they're producing, databases that they're producing or using, other kinds of research resources, um, the grants and contracts that are funding their work. And it's all about uh, putting together these connections. And, uh, and it's also it's about being able to be used in a very sort of flexible way um, and sort of picking and choosing the bits that are important for any particular application. Uh, because the ISF has a lot of possible different connections that you can make between things, and only a certain subset of them are going to apply in any given situation. So it's not about having a big metadata record with a bunch of fields that are either required or optional that you're filling in. It's a very different kind of thing. It's about making the kinds of connections that are appropriate to the context of the research that you're describing at a particular time. So this is about going beyond um, traditional CVs, you know, static documents that are just sort of big lists of publications or grants that people have gotten, um, or going beyond author lists on publications where you've got your two initials and a last name. I mean, all this kind of this data that we still have to deal with all the time. We want to get beyond that kind of structure and actually have real structure behind the data that shows where it's coming from and who's actually involved. Um, rather than just lists of text. And so it's about putting that research and scholarship in context, and by building out this richer context, uh, aiding, for one thing, with the idea of disambiguation, being able to figure out who is it that we're actually talking about. And as we move into a world with ORCID IDs and things like that, this is going to get easier, um, but that's, that's always going to be, um, to some extent, an issue. And so we want to be able to make it so that we can uh, build as much of that context around people um, as we're capturing that data rather than just having people's names floating around. Uh, we're also interested in getting uh, a richer vocabulary of roles for what people are doing, that there's, there's more to scholarship and research than just being listed as author number 27 on a paper. Um, there's all kinds of things that people are doing and things that they produce, uh, other kinds of outputs um, and eventually then outcomes that are more than just 
writing paper, there might be resources that you've produced, other things that you've contributed to your field. And so the ISF is about trying to set the stage for being able to capture those kinds of things in addition to what's traditionally been recorded. And as Dean mentioned, this is all about linked data. That's what we want. This, we want this to be open linked data that's discoverable and usable by different applications. Um, so this, this idea that you, from one address, from one identifier, you can go and get human readable stuff or get the structure data behind it. That's really what we try to keep in mind all the time. And so in the course of designing uh, the semantic framework and, and building out the ontologies, uh, we always try to come back and think if we're faced with a design decision about different ways that we could approach modeling something, there might be one that maybe is a little bit more correct in an ontology, pure ontology world, um, but it maybe doesn't work quite so well for people actually trying to consume that data for practical applications. And in that kind of balance, we usually come down on, we want to make it practical. We want to try to make it usable for, for things that are actually crawling this data and doing something with it, and also for the people who are producing that data um, to make that a, a, an easy thing to do and let the ontological details sometimes sort themselves out as they may. So to do this, we've incorporated in this, this framework uh, a bunch of existing linked data vocabularies. Uh, one that's probably familiar is Foth, friend of a friend. Uh, we use a piece of that for basic stuff about people, organizations, groups, um, some of that standard um, vocabulary. We're also now pulling in um, another W3C spec, uh, the VCARD ontology, which is a little bit in flux right now. It's being revised, but we're using the new version of that, which we're finding uh, pretty attractive as a nice way of getting um, all of that uh, you know, nitty gritty detail about people's name parts and their phone numbers and email addresses and how to contact them, getting all of the rich detail about that and bundled up in a nice way um, that we'll look at again in a minute. Uh, we're using BIBO, the bibliographic ontology, as sort of the, the core piece of how we represent publications. Um, that's something that may change a little bit in the future. We may extend that in different ways, but as sort of the, the nugget of what we're dealing with the publications, we find BIBO pretty attractive because it's, it's usually a pretty nice granularity. Um, it, it tends to, if you're familiar with the Ferber scale, the, the work expression manifestation item uh, continuum, it usually kind of falls in the expression-y sort of realm, which is usually what people are interested in talking about. Uh, so that often is a, is a pretty attractive way to model publications. Um, and then SCOS, the, uh, the Simple Knowledge Organization System for dealing with SORI and control vocabularies in broader and narrower terms and related terms, things like that. Um, that's another um, standard thing that we bring in. And, and there's sort of a, a little technical uh, you know, twist in, in the latest version of the L uh, web ontology language where when we bring in these other vocabularies for things like scientific terms, uh, we can sort of all treat, we can treat them all as SCOS vocabularies, even if they're also something else. So we have kind of a nice consistent way of being able to refer to terms that come in from these other taxonomies. And then coming in from the, from the eagle eye side of things, um, there's, a, there's a suite of ontologies under this OBO, this open biomedical ontologies umbrella. That, that are part of the BOISF. Um, and so some of those are things like the ontology of biomedical investigations, which allows you to describe in greater detail about what actually happens in the course of, of an investigation, of an experiment. Um, things like the planned process that you go through, the, you know, the methods you use, things like that. And again, that's a case where a lot of data that you might be putting into a Vivo system or a Vivo life system, you might not have that kind of stuff. Um, and so you can ignore it and leave it out if you're not interested in that. But that, that rich detail is there um, if, if you have it and if it's available. And so we, we try to encourage uh, being able to capture as much detail as people are willing to put in and not get stuck by having not having a slot to stick it in. Um, so that's, that's the OB. There's, of course, Eagle Eye Research Ontology, all the work that came out of the Eagle Eye Grant for modeling research resources. Um, RO, the relationship ontology for sort of a, a common uh, core set of relationships, like something being part of something else, or containing other, th other things. And then um, IAO, the information artifact ontology, uh, which sort of goes a little bit beyond the, the bibliographic stuff, and also is kind of a core set of metadata for, for other things in the ontology. 
And so these things in the, in the biomedical world, um, in, in this OBO um, suite of ontologies, they all sort of descend, they extend this basic formal ontology. And so as a result, Vivo ISF now all sits under this common top level ontology. And I'm not going to go into detail about this, but um, this, is, this is sort of the philosophical grounding for, for the, the whole world that these biomedical ontologies live in. And so you get into very abstract ideas like occurrence and continuance and things that exist fully at one instant in time and things that play out over time and stuff like that. Um, and, and the idea here is that we, it's, it's nice to sort of feel like we are fitting into a basic coherent philosophy of ontologies. But again, we don't always, we don't religiously adhere to this. So that you know, if, if it comes down to wanting to do something that's gonna have a practical result for actually trying to share data, and it doesn't necessarily quite fit the basic formal ontology, uh, we're probably gonna do it anyway. So one of the things that, you know, this is actually a perfect example, something that doesn't quite fit exactly with what BFO would do, but, but we do it because it's important. Um, that one of the, the basic patterns that we use a lot in Vivo ISF is this notion of a reified relationship. Um, so if you're familiar at all with, with RDF and its predicate structure where you have a subject and you've got a predicate that points out to some other object, um, that, that's a really nice, simple model and it's great for a lot of things, but it also it, it breaks down at certain points. The nice thing about RDF is that you can say anything you want about anything. Um, the problem with RDF is that you can say anything you want about anything. And, and what you often run into is, is contradictory information when things change over time. Um, that people don't just stay in one position their entire career, they move around, they do different things. And if you just make simple statements like John, employee of University of Chicago, well, that might be true today, and it might not be true next year. So if these triples are just floating around out there together and mixing around in the wild, eventually you're going to have to try to figure out which of these things is actually true at the time that you're looking at the data. And so we try to give you better clues for figuring out what's actually correct at the time you're, you're querying. Um, so we have this, this node that we put in the middle of two things. So instead of just having one subject, predicate, object here, we take the predicate position and stick another, another resource in between. So you actually end up with a triple going from this subject, predicate, object, and then that in turn becomes a subject of its own with another predicate to another object. And so we can actually treat the relationship as an entity unto itself that can have its own metadata. And one of the important things of that is putting times and dates on. So we do that for things like positions, we do that for things like authorship, instead of just saying somebody author of publication or publication that has creator, has contributor, or somebody, um, there's a node for representing the actual authorship if you want, usually want to hang additional data off of that to, to further qualify that idea. And, and that basic pattern plays out in a number of other places. And that's what we often really try to do with Vivo ISF is that while we might make things initially a little bit more complex than you might see in other ontologies, we try to make it a good trade-off so that once you learn that new pattern, you see that new pattern being applied in a lot of different places so that it becomes familiar to you. And hopefully that richer data, that richer structure is going to be a lot more useful for the applications that are actually trying to consume this data. So here's the idea that if somebody has a position and the position is then in turn linked to the organization, that now because that position is a resource on its own, we can say that position uh, was held over a particular time interval. So someone was at University of Chicago, they had a, a full or a, you know, a, a postdoc position from 2007 to 2009, and then they moved on and went somewhere else. And we can keep around all of this data. We don't have to try to pull it out of the web. We don't have to try to retract it or say it's invalid. It can live there harmoniously with all of the current new data. We can build up this CV, this distributed CV over time of, of how people's careers evolve because we can accurately say what was true at a given period of time. So here is the notion of two different positions. Somebody moves from position one with one time interval they move to position two, and we don't have to delete any of that old data. We don't have to pull away position one. 
you just close its time interval, say it's got an end date, we'll open a new time interval for position two, and we can start building up the system. And similarly, because we're using the V-card standard uh, for things like people's names, I mean, one of the, the sort of stupid things that you end up dealing with anytime you're dealing with people is people's names change. Um, and, they, and if you can figure out at what point they changed, then it becomes a lot easier. And so we can explicitly represent that kind of thing in our semantic data by having things bundled up into a nice V-card, essentially a business card that's true for a certain interval of time. And you can put a time interval on that and say, this is the accurate information for this date range, open up a new one for a new date range, and we can start aggregating that data and you know which is true at a particular time, and it's not stepping, they're not stepping on each other's toes. So again, the same exact pattern that we just saw with positions, do the exact same kind of thing with v -card. And similarly, because we've got the vCard as a, as a resource on its own that can have its own metadata, you can associate that with an authorship. We have the authorship, again, as its own resource. And so you can say, here's the particular form of a name that somebody published with on a particular publication. This was the contact information that they listed with this particular publication. And, and it's very clear what's associated with what. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of a slot for everything that you can fill in. Um, even if it's not necessarily something you're going to fill in in every case. You build the, build the relationships that are important um, for the context you're describing. So going beyond the, the pure notion of authorship and people being listed as, as authors of documents, um, roles are very big in Viva ISF. This is something that you know, we get this basic notion of a role now from the basic formal ontology, so it ties into broader notions of roles elsewhere. And so we really want to try to make it as attractive as possible to capture richer detail about what people are doing in the course of actually pursuing their research um, in addition to just what eventually results from it. Um, so in addition to just being an author on a, on a paper, we also want to capture the fact that you have a particular role in a project or you have a role in some kind of event or activity, um, the different things that then ultimately might have an output that is a more familiar kind of artifact. And so, again, this is the notion that, that we have this, this kind of, you know, this set of, this web of things that you can kind of build in whatever complexity <coughs> is useful for what you're trying to describe. We give you that basic vocabulary to, to stick things together with. And so you can link together all kinds of different roles that people might have to different projects or different pieces of projects. You can make it as detailed as you want or as simple as you want. Um, and then ultimately, those activities, those projects, those kinds of temporal things can have documents and resources that, that come out of them. And again, those can be inputs to other things. It's a, it's a very generalized framework for kind of building out these relationships. So when you have all this data, what can you do with it? So, so here's an example of what you can do with linked open data. This is the uh, beta.vivosearch.org. And so this goes around and, and crawls linked data from not only Vivo software installations, but other software types that are then publishing using the Vivo ISF ontology and publishing the same kind of linked open data. And putting it together in a search index, uh, so it's kind of, you know, it's a Google-like activity going around and, and, and gathering data, but instead of scraping it off of HTML pages, it's pulling it out of the structured data. And so here's the, the network of different things that are pulled into this index. Um, and so over on the left, all these different blue things are things that are actually using our Vivo um, application. Um, and on the right are some other things like uh, Harvard Profiles, which is a totally different software application. Looks nothing the same under the hood, but it's storing the same kind of RDF triples in its triple store. It's publishing Vivo linked open data, and it can be harvested into this index the same way that the um, similarly, Iowa's Loki system, it's got a completely different database for natively storing its data, but it's got a trans translation layer on the top that can dynamically turn that into linked open data if you come and make these linked open data requests. And so this, this, uh, the crawler that's building this index can put these all together and, and make um, a nice consistent search interface out of it. 
Uh, this is Vivo Search Light uh, by uh, Miles Worthington. Uh, another example of what you can do once you've gone and aggregated this linked open data, where if you're at a particular page and you highlight some text that you're interested in, it can go and look up and find uh, different people who might be working on that topic or have some expertise in it, um, and let you click through to their Vivo profiles and learn more about them. Um, and so it's, it's, again, it's using that linked open data to, to provide the basis for being able to do that look up. Um, here's a, a search engine that is uh, not, you know, wasn't created by someone directly affiliated with the Vivo effort. Uh, this is uh, Dave Eichmann's group at University of Iowa with CTSA Search, and so the <coughs> Clinical Translational Science Awards, uh, they have adopted the Vivo ontology as their sort of recommended way of sharing researcher networking data. And so he's got a, a search here that goes and also uh, gathers that, that semantic data from these different CTSA sites. And as you can see, they've got you know, 124,945 persons and 19 different institutions and over you know, 1.3 million publications. And so they're building up a, a quite rich network of big data out there. And so this is an example of an application that isn't trying to go and, and search the entire world of linked data, but it's identified a particular set of institutions, a particular set of sites that are of interest, and is, is crawling those particular sites uh, for a particular purpose. So some of the use cases that we hope ISF uh, is going to be useful for in, in building applications, uh, doing things like being able to, to find the Publications that resulted from grants, being able to reverse those relationships, see what funded what, uh, being able to discover and, and uh, reuse facilities or equipment, things that, have, that an investment has been made in and um, should be possibly more optimally reused than they might currently be. Uh, this is one of the, you know, the classic Eagle Eye use cases, being able to, to reuse uh, resources efficiently, uh, demonstrate the importance of different facilities on a campus, um, in, in actually producing research results and being able to discover people who have access to resources or have expertise in particular techniques. And so this again, going back to, looping back to the CTSA Connect project, uh, uh, Stony Brook and, and Florida and OHSU were heavily involved in, in this project of being able to link together clinicians and uh, researchers by taking the, the codes um, that were associated with the particular things that the clinicians were treating in their practice um, and matching that up with, with mesh words from what the researchers were researching and making those ties through the unified medical language system and then ultimately tying that all together with the ISF to publish that as linked data. So this basic notion of this, you know, this, this bench to bedside idea of being able to get the, the research more quickly from the researchers to the, the clinicians. Uh, being able to, to find those connections that are going to make that happen um, is another application for this kind of linked data. And looking a little more towards uh, some other ways of expanding ISF, uh, especially you know, Steve McCauley and Ted Lawless and Brown have been doing a lot of work at looking at the, the peculiarities of some aspects of the humanities and artistic works especially with, for things where someone has created a work but then wants to be able to track all the different people who have performed it in different venues and different places, uh, works that have been translated into different languages, collections and exhibits that have been on an ongoing basis and you want to be able to then aggregate all of that together because that's part of the evidence of the impact that this scholar has had. Um, these are things that, again, it's, it's a sort of a natural extension of what UISF is doing, and also an example of the way that it has these multiple different pieces that you can mix and match and choose from for a particular application. And so, uh, if you want to get involved to learn more about uh, what Vivo ISF is doing, we've got uh, bi-weekly calls uh, as part of this Vivo ISF working group as part of the DuraSpace umbrella. Um, and so there's a link here to our wiki page. You can look for the ontology working group under there. Uh, we'd like to invite anybody to join the calls and, and, uh, and learn more about what we're doing and get involved and give us some uh, feedback and um, ideas. And so here's just a brief list of some of the different uh, interest groups, things that people have been talking about recently in the group, looking at more detail around grants. Um, Again, the humanities aspects, uh, things like knowledge mobilization, about how you actually get the stuff that universities are doing um, into, into practice in the community, um, more about annotation and provenance, uh, and also more detail about publications. Um, 
So, so we've looked at a lot of different ways that ISF is extended to, to research resources and to other things. And now I'm going to hand it back to Dean for more about uh, linked data in libraries. OK, so I'm going to be talking about a, a very new uh, project called uh, Linked Data for Libraries, creating a scholarly resource semantic information store. Um, so last Thursday, uh, the Mellon Foundation made a grant to Cornell, uh, Stanford, and Harvard uh, for basically a million dollars um, starting uh, this coming January. Um, so the partners will work together to take this same kind of idea that you just saw in the biomedical area and apply it to uh, scholarly information resources. So basically sort of extend the Vivo model and ontology to cover all of the kind of contextual information around scholarly information resources, um, relationships, metadata, broad context. So this will leverage the work that Vivo's done. We're also actually leveraging the work of the, the, uh, the Hydro Partnership um, and, uh, and stuff they've been working on. That's part of the, uh, the effort. So the project team at Cornell, um, I'm on it. Uh, John Corson Reichert, Brian, um, and Simeon Warner. We've got another one and a half new FTE. Um, at Harvard, it's David Weinberger, uh, Paul Lushner, and they'll be bringing an outside consultant with expertise in the Link David area. Uh, at Stanford, um, so the official participants are Tom Kramer um, and one new FT that'll be full time on this. But when I just talked to him about our first meeting, he said he had about eight people in his group that he wants to bring in um, and engage with this effort. And I think we're going to be doing doing a lot of that um, as well. So, what is the goal of this uh, effort? It's to create a scholarly resource semantic information store. Uh, a model that works both within individual institutions and through a coordinated extensible network of linked open data to capture the intellectual value that librarians and other domain experts add to information resources when they describe, annotate, organize, select, and use those resources together with the social value evident for patterns of usage. So we want to draw on the work that uh, the Harvard Innovation Lab has been doing with their library cloud, where they're tracking usage information about information resources. We want to pull in things like live guides and other sources, where right now librarians have been adding value, but typically in sort of very siloed systems that doesn't necessarily inform what's, what exists in the basic catalog and the basic search mechanisms. And to make all these things available then to support discovery and use of, uh, of the materials. There's a quick look at sort of our project timeline. Um, uh, beginning now, we're starting to work on sort of the initial ontology design. Identify all these disparate data sources. I mean, that's one of the one of the reasons we're very glad that we have both Harvard and Stanford working with us on this is we, we see ourselves as all having individual sort of localized sources of added value for these uh, for the information resources. Um, Stanford's looking at some of their archival and manuscript descriptive information and being able to fold that in. You mentioned the Harvard Library Cloud work. Um, we'll begin creating this, uh, what we're calling the CIRSIS, which is actually takes code from the Vivo project. Uh, the underlying software is called Vitro. You just pull out the Vivo ontology. You can plug in any ontology you want. You have to do a little tuning to make everything look good. but uh, so, so that's going to be part of that, uh, that work. And then connected with Hydra, where Hydra now has a component called Active Fedora that talks to a Fedora backend as the sort of store. We're going to build an Active Triples Ruby layer that, uh, that will interact with a, uh, a triple store in the same way and then let you use the rest of the sort of Hydra uh, framework up above that. Um, second half of the year, we'll work to complete an initial ontology. Uh, and pilot initial data ingests at Cornell. Um, maybe of interest to some of you here, we'll be running a workshop in uh, December where we bring folks from 10 to 12 uh, institutions to help give us feedback on the ontology, on the overall uh, approach and design, uh, to make connections to support potentially piloting this at other institutions. And to understand how the institutions see this fitting into other um, collaborations that are happening now, uh, DPLA, Vivo, Share, I mean, people are doing all sorts of uh, collaborative work. We want to find out how can this best 
Uh, how can this approach best fit into that environment? And for the second year, we'll be doing um, pilot instances at Harvard and Stanford, populate our own instance from multiple data sources. Uh, Color is our curated uh, list of library resources. It's a framework for organizing and annotating uh, existing uh, resources in, the, in our collections. Um, we will develop a test instance of a, a search uh, across the partner institutions. Um, integrate with active triples. Uh, let's see. Up. Then July. So the second half of 2015, um, we'll do a full public release of the open source code, uh, public release of the active triples hydro component, uh, public release of the ontology, um, full functional instances, and a full demonstration system. So project outcomes. Um, the primary outcome of the project we see is this sort of open source extensible ontology, compatible with the Vivo ontology, compatible with BibFrame. We're going to be working with other existing, and there are a lot of library linked open data efforts going on. We really want to, uh, to, to work to be compatible with all of those. Um, so things like the open annotation and other things. Um, the, we'll release the open source uh, sources semantic editing display and discovery system and the Project Hydro compatible interface to the sources. Um, let's see, I think at this point we are to the question stage. Well, thank you all very much. And, uh